Good morning, Orange Avenue family. We've been praying and preparing for this service, this moment, for several days now. So I'm excited to get down to business. What a blessing it is to have a time set aside for the worship of our King. And that's exactly what this service is for. Today is focused on worship. The lineup might seem a little bit unusual, and it will be, but everything is being done for His glory. Before we jump into the service, I'd like to say a prayer for the hearts of those listening online. So for you. Let's go ahead and pray now. God, thank you so much for this time today. I know that people who are listening are generally still at home and are not able to be around everybody as they wish to be. So God, they might be feeling a little bit empty, a little bit down. So God, I'm going to ask you right now to fill them. So even when they are alone, that they can feel surrounded and loved by you. God, be with those who lead us today, who are guiding our thoughts and encouraging us. I know that you've been preparing them and helping them to craft what they're going to say. So God, I pray those words come out as they're supposed to, that you always get the glory. God, help our church to be a light in the community, to be a light in a dark world, to make a difference. And this is all in your son's name we pray. Amen. Good morning, church. Welcome to our Sunday morning gathering. We're going to talk about a new step in our vision this morning. So as you know, our vision is being fully committed to Jesus and making him known. And the last two weeks, we've talked about being a devoted disciple of Jesus. And also a part of that is being committed to unceasing prayer. And this morning, we want to make sure that we talk about uh, being people who are committed to vibrant worship. And uh, Scott and I are actually going to team preach this morning. So you're going to see Scott and then come back to me in just a little bit. But we're going to cover three big main things. That as vibrant worshipers, we should always worship all inspired, Christ-focused, and spirit-filled. If you turn your Bibles over to Psalm 63, I want to read that psalm with you this morning. It says, Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name I will lift my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food, and my mouth will praise you with joyful lips, when I remember you on my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night. For you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings I will sing for joy. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me, but those who seek to destroy my life shall go down into the depths of the earth. They shall be given over to the power of the sword. They shall be a portion for jackals. But the king shall rejoice in God. All who swear by him shall exult, for the mouths of liars shall be stopped. You know, many scholars believe that David is writing this when he is on the run from Saul. Can you imagine being able to feel that way and write these things when your life is in danger and you're on the run from your best friend's dad? It would be an incredible thing, like this huge tumultuous deal going on in David's life. And he's able to sit down and write things like uh, my favorite in in verse 3 that says, Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. This morning as we talk about being vibrant worshipers, I want to ask you one big question as we begin. What is it about God that makes him worthy of your praise? You know, I think about uh, just how awesome he is. And David wrote about how awesome God really is and his love is just better than life. And, And you think about it, like if I'm in that circumstance, I'd be thinking about everything negative that was going on. I'd be thinking about my circumstances. I'd be thinking about the one who's chasing me. I'd think about the food that I'm not eating and the luxuries I don't have at that moment. But not David. He sat down and he penned this thing and he said, your love is better than life, so my lips will glorify you. Our perspective is so important as we come into worship. You know, our God is an incredible God, 
And I want to show you just a couple of pictures here on the screen uh, just to get you to think about how grand he really is. So the first one is simple. It's just, it, it's a galaxy. And it's, uh, just look at how beautiful it is. Look at how vast it is. But I want you to just really bask in the fact that within that galaxy, you are a tiny speck of a speck of a speck. And you can even keep on going down. Like our God is creator God. And everything that he made, like we are just a tiny little part. But the next picture will bring you back to a little bit of a, like a more earth reality. These are the hands of a baby. Now, spoiler, that's my baby, or one of them. That's Noble's hands. Uh, but, but it just shows me also that while God is so big, he is so vast, he cares so much about the little intricacies of life. I mean, you look at those little hands that were formed inside of the womb. And they were, they were there, fingers, fingernails and everything in the womb. It's incredible and it's weird, but it's God and it's him as creator. And I want you to just think about this morning as we sing a few songs that are just responding to how awesome God is, that he is the God who created all the universe, but he's the God who cares about the little details of you and me. So let's sing together. Let's stand together and let's sing it like we mean it. Why? Because this is the almighty creator God that we get to sing to. So just like if, a, if you were playing basketball in front of one of the top coaches in the world, or if you were singing in front of, uh, I don't really know who, the American Idol judges, or if, if you like came face to face with the president of the United States or some foreign dignitary, you would bring your best. This morning, we get to come before the throne of Almighty God. So let's give him our best as we sing these next few songs. Just a question to get you guys started. Kenny, as he finished, asked everyone to stand and sing. So I just wanted to see, did you do that? Go ahead and raise a hand. Next time, Kenny's going to ask if you raised your hand. So stand up and sing if we call you to it, maybe. I don't know. You guys might have been sitting still for a while now. So it's time to get on your feet um, after this part. On wedding day, who is the focus? It's always the bride, right? The parents are escorted in by the groomsmen. They walk back out, and then they walk in with the bridesmaids. And even as the groom walks in with the officiant, everyone stays seated the entire time. But something changes right before the bride enters. You're beckoned to rise, to get on your feet. Uh, and the officiant does this little thing with his hands where he like tries to get everybody on their feet. Everyone else had music, but the music becomes elegant and lovely for the special lady to walk down the aisle. And all of a sudden, the doors are thrown open, and lo and behold, a woman in white gracefully moves towards the front of the room. She's escorted by her father, but most of the time he doesn't get noticed unless there's an exceptional number of tears. Um, the day is meticulously planned so that everyone would enjoy this particular moment when she walks down the aisle. Here comes the bride. My job right now is to, is to convince you that when God pushed the play button on the earth, he had in mind a particular moment, the moment when the entire world would be overwhelmed by his grace and by this presence. I'll use the end of Ephesians 5 to make this point. So it's Ephesians chapter 5, verses 21 through 33. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body just as Christ does the church, for we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. I started off asking on wedding day, who is the focus? Well, when Jesus came to the earth, who was his focus on? It was on the bride, his church. 
On mine and Brittany's wedding day, I knew there were other people present. And some even drove up from Florida. But I only had eyes for Brittany. She was the only one that had my attention. But the other cool part of that is when the bride, when, when the bride was coming down the aisle, when Brittany saw me, she only saw me. She forgot about everybody else. And she was trying to see, like, was I crying? Was I tearful in that moment? And I was. Uh, but she was there for me. The church is meant to be the same way. While we recognize there is a world around us, our attention is fully focused on Christ, our husband and our king. On your first day as husband and wife, when you first, or when you first follow Jesus, it's not hard to only have eyes for one another. But in the days that follow, that's when your vows are truly tested. While worship is meant to be between us and him, those who should have been faithful sometimes welcome distractions. And while we should only have eyes for one another, we are prone to let them wander. As we worship today, we still recognize that there is darkness around us, but how we worship is what sets us apart from the rest of the world. If you've ever invited a friend to come with you to church, one thing you might feel could be strange to them would be the worship. But worship is often the most engaging, beautiful thing that we do. It's a way for every voice to be lifted, for every member to have a place. And although some voices sound quite different, some are beautiful and some are a little bit gravelly, some are high and sometimes are really low, Every praise is always for him. So as we continue, continue singing and praising right now, keep your eyes focused on the one who you were made for, the one who has chosen for you from the beginning of time. Reject distractions and know where they come from, but also where they lead. Their goal is to take you away from the one who loves you and proceed down the aisle toward Jesus, the husband of the church and our king. Man, it is so awesome to be able to focus on King Jesus as we take communion and as we sing songs that are just all about him. But I want to ask you something, like on a normal Sunday or, or Wednesday, when you walk into church, what are you usually filled with? If you're anything like me, I might be filled with a little bit of anger from the two-minute drive that, I, like, that got me to church because something happened or I had to rush a kid out of the house. I might be filled with that late night sports event that I watched on Saturday night and it took me all the way up to uh, way past my bedtime and I was, so I was still thinking about it. I might be filled up with that movie I watched or the book that I was reading. Well, in reality, what we should be filled with as we walk into worship is just the Spirit of God. You know, in Acts chapter 16, beginning around verse 16, we get Paul and Silas in Philippi. And as they are walking around Philippi and, and they're doing their work and teaching in the house of prayer, they have this little girl that is following them. And this little girl is filled with a spirit of divination. And, uh, and we're going to talk real quick about an accidental healing that happens. Because as Paul and Silas are doing their work and this young lady is following them, she just keeps crying out. Like, these men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you salvation. And she's saying that over and over and over again. And there's nothing wrong with what she's saying. But what Acts 16 says is that Paul gets so annoyed that she is just following them and saying these things that he kind of accidentally heals her because he gets so annoyed just says, like, in the name of Jesus, come out of her. And all of a sudden, what happens, though, in Philippi is a great mess because that, that little servant girl, the people who owned her, were making great money off of her gift that they thought she had. In that spirit of divination, she was able to kind of fortune tell. And so people would come to talk to her and find out what their futures look like. But in a moment of annoyance, he doesn't just heal her from that spirit. He takes away her owner's livelihoods. And so they, they bring this great crowd and they start talking about like, uh, these men are talking about things that don't fit in our Roman customs. And, and they're right about that. But it gets to the point where Paul and Silas are arrested. They are heavily beaten and thrown into the inner prison, and, sh and their legs are shackled with chains. But I want to focus not on that part of the story, but on Acts 16, beginning in verse 25. And here's what the, those two verses will say. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison was shaken. And immediately all the doors were open and everyone's bonds 
were fastened. You know, I don't know about you, or sorry, they were unfastened, not fastened, uh, but I don't know about you, but in the, in the situation that Paul and Silas found themselves in, my focus is going to be on a few things. It's going to be on the beating that I just received. It's going to be on the guards that are surrounding me in that prison, and it's going to be on the shackles that are on my feet. And church, so many times we walk into this building or, or any place where we're getting ready to go and sing to God. And we are so filled up with the things that this, that the week has given us, like those things that have been beating us up. We are so filled with the things that are shackling us. And when I say that, we're, we're like shackled down by sin far too often. And so when we come and we approach the throne of God and we want to be, uh, you know, all inspired and we want to be Christ focused, but sometimes it's so hard because we bring so much baggage to the table. I want to ask you this week, as we start to sing together, can we take our focus off of the things that have beaten us up? Can we take our focus off of the things that are holding us in bondage? And can we release those from from ourselves so that we can now worship filled with the Spirit of God? Hey, we are so glad that you've joined us this morning, and we're about to have a little bit of time of reflection. And I just want to remind you uh, really briefly about what we've talked about and ask you to reflect on just a few things. So as we are exploring what it means to be vibrant worshipers of God, we've talked about being awe-inspired. We've talked about being Christ-focused, and we've talked about being Spirit-filled. And as we enter into this brief time of reflection, I want you to think about maybe this week how you can spend more time out in creation so that you can be more awe-inspired. Or maybe you need to really focus this week on just how good King Jesus is. Or perhaps you need to be able to figure out and, and, and take this to God that there are so many different things that are filling your mind and filling your heart that you need to figure out and, and really focus on this morning how to get rid of those things that are filling you up, and how to be filled with the Spirit. Because when we're together at last, all together, I can't wait to rock this place with the worship that is all inspired Christ-focused, and Spirit-filled. Love you, Orange Avenue.